Good morning, Revive Wesley and our McKinley campus. How you doing? Good to see you. My name is Kevin, this is my wife Becky, and we are the co-campus pastors at our East Aurora campus. And we're glad to be with you here this morning. Did you know that we are one church in five different locations, five different campuses, and uh, we lead the campus in East Aurora. And many of you are thinking, where is Paul right now? What is going on? Well, uh, just so you know, uh, we also not just lead the East Aurora campus, but I lead the, our campus pastors, our writing team that writes the messages together every single week. We have an amazing team. And we were thinking if we're one church, five campuses, what about this summer for this week and maybe in the future, we just have the pastors who are leading those sites rotate around so you can see and hear what's going on. And just want to let's send our greetings from our East Aurora campus as well as every other campus to say that God is on the move. He is doing something through Revive Wesleyan and we're glad that you're a part of it. Could you give God a round of applause just for what he's doing? And if you didn't know as well, if you go on our website, revivewesleyan.com, if you click on watch a message or messages on there, you'll see all of our messages at every campus here at McKinley. It's video, but every other campus has the audio version there as well. So if you ever want to just listen to kind of see different illustrations or whatnot, the big ideas are the same, the messages are the same, but our stories are a little different because I can't tell someone else's story the same way they can, right? But we're honored to be with you here today. And Becky, do you want to say anything as we're here in front of our... You're doing McKinley? great. Keep it up. Awesome. Yep. And a big welcome to those watching online as well. We are continuing our series, To Be Continued, looking at the life of Joshua. And so before we continue this week two of the series, would you bow your heads as we pray together? God, we thank you so much for what you're doing. We are so grateful, just as we sang, that you are a God of love and grace and mercy. So I pray this morning, God, that we would meet with, e with you, each one of us, in a very real and special way. That, God, you would speak exactly what we need to hear for our situations. We pray your Holy Spirit would have the loudest voice in our lives. And, God, we ask that we be open to all that you have. That the words of our mouths, the meditation of our hearts, would be pleasing to you. And would your transformative, life-giving, powerful word that's alive and active, God, would you make us more like your son as we hear it? And not just hear it, but also respond in obedience. So, God, we thank you again. Thank you for these people. I ask your will be done. Your kingdom come in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, uh, we're going to be digging into Joshua 3 this morning. And if I want to encourage you to actually open your Bible. And so if you don't have an, a Bible with you, there should be a Bible in the seat in front of you, underneath the seat in front of you. If you're using a, a chair Bible, it should be on page 209. The scripture is always on the screen, but there's just something about opening up uh, that book. And so we're going to be digging into that in just a little bit. But first of all, summertime in Buffalo. It is that brief but glorious time of the year when we can actually enjoy the weather and enjoy being outside, enjoy the sunshine. And for many of us, that also means enjoying some kind of body of water, whether it's the swimming pool or the lake or the ocean. We just love to take advantage of this time for water sports and activities, but that also means that we have to kind of remind ourselves of all of the water safety rules. We gotta get out our life jackets, dust off the puddle jumpers for the kids. We pay people to watch us swim. They're called lifeguards. All of this is wise because we need to have a healthy fear of water because it can turn from fun to dangerous in a moment. Well, a time in my life when I failed to have this healthy uh, respect and fear for water uh, was when I was in my early 20s. My older brother and I, this is how cool I was, we went on spring break together, okay? So going on spring break with your older brother. Uh, we were in spring break in Florida. And uh, we were playing in the ocean, having a blast. And actually, the irony of this is that both of us were lifeguards at the time. So we kind of went in a little bit overconfident. We were good swimmers. Um, and we underestimated the ocean's power. We had been out in the waves for a while and kind of just kept drifting into deeper and deeper water. We weren't too concerned about it. We were hanging out, talking, swimming, having fun. And then we did start to get tired. And so we thought, you know what? We should probably swim back to the beach. However, we found that no matter how hard we tried, we couldn't get closer to the beach. No matter what stroke we used, no matter how hard we swam, we actually kept drifting further away from the beach. And I found myself getting really tired. I could just feel my strength and my courage kind of draining out of me, and I kind of started to panic. And so I looked to my older brother, 
We had been on many adventures before. He had gotten me out of many of tight situations before, only to find that my older brother was looking at me, wide eyes in fear. I had never seen him that fearful before. And you'll never guess what happened next. But that story is to be continued. Mm. Did you see what I did there? Yeah, the series to be continued. We'll continue that in just a moment, but let's refocus our attention and continue the story that we started with Joshua last week. If you have your Bible, Joshua chapter 3, because today we're going to talk about fear. We're also going to talk about a story that involves some water as well. But to recap, in case you missed last week, we learned that God told Joshua as he was on this quest to lead the people of Israel to the promised land after being enslaved for 40 years, wandering in the desert, in the wilderness. He said, be strong and courageous. As he was about to take this next step on that journey, on that quest. And last week, we also learned that to be strong and courageous, it means that we need to keep God's word close to us. Because God went on to say, meditate on my word day and night. Right? Like that, that, that's, that's a crucial, important part of understanding who I am, my character, my presence, my power. And we do that by saying it and obeying it. And this week, Joshua's quest to the promised land continues, and it involves him leading the people, God's people, the people of Israel, across the Jordan River to this beautiful promised land that they told, were told about. And the Israelites were told to watch for something in particular that would guide them. See if you can figure out what that is as they take these next steps toward the promised land. Joshua chapter 3, beginning in verse 1, says this. Early in the morning, Joshua and all the Israelites set out from Shatim and went to Jordan, where they camped before crossing over. After three days, the officers went throughout the camp, giving orders to the people. When you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God and the Levitical priests carrying it, you are to move out from your position and follow it. Then you'll know which way to go, since you've never been this way before. You ever feel like that? Never been there before? But keep a distance of about 2,000 cubits between you and the ark. Do not go near it. All right, so in this scene, God is telling Joshua, you're the new leader of Israel, taking over from Moses, who led for decades. I'm about to take you to a place that you've never been before. So keep your eyes on me. Now, Joshua, as a new leader, could have said, okay, everybody, Israel, gather around. Everybody, keep your eyes on me. I'm the new leader. I'm the one calling the shots. Just follow where my lead. He could have said that. But God, as he said this in this opening couple verses of chapter 3, he's making it clear that the hero of the story is not Joshua, that the hero of the story is not Israel. It's God himself. Keeping their eyes on God will guide them, in, guide the people of Israel into this unknown territory, the promised land that God told them about. So the question I have for you today is this. How do you keep your eyes on God? Where is he? What does that even look like? Well, this is where the Ark of the Covenant comes into play. You see, God made a promise to his people, the people of Israel, through Moses, God promised that good things would happen to his people and future generations if they obeyed his laws. They kept them close, like we talked about. But he also warned them that if they didn't, if they kept their eyes off God, that they would experience punishment and despair and if they disobeyed him. And so as a sign of God's covenant, he had the Israelites make a wooden box known as the Ark of the Covenant. I have a picture up on the screen here. It looks something kind of like this, covered in gold. The power and the presence of God was in this, the Ark of the Covenant. And inside the Ark of the Covenant contained God's written word, the Ten Commandments. So if you're taking notes, the Ark represented God's power and presence with his people. So Joshua told the people to look for the Ark of the Covenant as the symbol that God was with them and to follow that. But he also had this odd caveat. He said, follow it at a distance of 2,000 cubits, which to you and I means about a half a mile. So follow it, but not too closely. Don't get too near it. Why was that? Well, because the Ark of the Covenant represented God's power and presence, you didn't want to mess with it or even accidentally touch it. In the Old Testament, when that happened, people died. 
And so God's power and presence are not to be trifled with. And the people knew that. In fact, the earlier generation was told this in Deuteronomy 10, verses 12 and 13. God told the people, and now Israel, what does the Lord your God ask of you? But to fear the Lord your God, to walk in obedience to him, to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and to observe the Lord's commandments and decrees that I'm giving for you today for your own good. And then in verse 20, it says, fear the Lord your God and serve him. Hold fast to him. So being strong and courageous, ironically, requires fearing God. Well, what does it mean to fear God? This is an interesting concept. Well, Deuteronomy 10 gives us a little bit of insight. It it means to revere and respect his power and presence by obeying him, by loving him, by serving him. But what this also means, and we see this throughout the story of Israel, is that uh, we have to understand that God will punish disobedience and sin because it causes separation from God. Sin cannot be in the presence of a holy, righteous God. And separation from God, well, that just means death. And so like any loving parent, God punishes disobedience. Did you catch that last phrase? It's such a parent thing to say, for your own good. And because sin can't be in God's presence, when a sinful human being got close to the Ark of the Covenant in the Old Testament, they died. Fortunately for you and me, Jesus came to take that punishment of sin on himself when he died on the cross. And so now in New Testament times, you and I can draw near to God through faith in Jesus. We don't have to follow God from a half mile distance. We can draw so close to him. So though we have a healthy fear of God, we're not scared of him. We're not afraid of him. Romans 8, 38 and 39 promises that nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. When we put our faith in Jesus, Jesus covers us. And so fearing God is to revere him, to respect him, to obey him, and to be in awe of his power and presence Going to Niagara Falls is always a good reminder of this. When you go to Niagara Falls, you are in awe of it, but one misstep and things can go badly very quickly. We're reminded of how big and powerful the falls are and how small and weak we are in comparison. You don't want to mess with that kind of power. You're going to get hurt. Well, how much more true is this of God, the creator of everything, the creator of life itself? Well, my brother and I had to learn to have that healthy fear of powerful things, to revere and respect it. Spoiler alert, we made it back. I survived. I knew you were on the edge of your seat, all right, but I just wanted to let you know so you didn't have to wonder about that anymore. What happened was my brother realized we were probably in a riptide, and even though it goes against what you would think, you have to swim parallel to the beach. That's what we did. We finally got back to the beach completely exhausted, But I learned a lesson. If you don't have the appropriate fear for things that are powerful, you're going to get hurt. And so going back to Joshua's story, this is why the people were told to give the Ark of the Covenant a wide berth. This is why they were told to give it some space, because as the symbol of God's power and presence, it was to be treated with great reverence, especially with what God was about to do. And this is a very meaningful event. Because Joshua even had some more special instructions as as we look at the next couple verses, verse 5 of chapter 3. Joshua told the people, consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. And Joshua said to the priest, take up the Ark of the Covenant and pass on ahead of the people. So they took it up and went ahead of them. Now don't miss this because it's very easy to read over this section. But God is so powerful. God is so holy that he had the people prepare themselves to participate with what he was about to do. Did you catch that? For them to consecrate, to set themselves apart, that meant they had to bathe. That didn't happen every single day back in that day. But it also meant they had to wash their clothes. It also meant abstaining from sexual activity so that their full attention was on God. No distractions. He was about to do something amazing. They needed to be laser-focused on the power and presence of God in order to follow him 
no matter where God might lead them. And you won't believe where they get led next, where God leads them. Let's pick up in verse 7. Joshua 3, 7 says, And the Lord said to Joshua, Today I will begin to exalt you in the eyes of all Israel, so that they may know that I am with you as I was with Moses. Tell the priests who carry the Ark of the Covenant, When you reach the edge of the Jordan's waters, go and stand in the river. Now there's so much wrapped up in that phrase, go and stand in the river. It sounds pretty simple at first, right? Like, okay, just go stand in the river. But the next few verses, Joshua explains in more detail that that means that the priests were to carry the Ark of the Covenant ahead of the people of Israel, the Israelites, and stand in the middle of the river. And once the priests were in the middle of the river with the Ark of the Covenant, then the people of Israel would be able to cross behind them in order to enter into the Promised Land, which was just on the other side of this river. But wait, it gets a little more intense. Let's continue in verse 15. Now the Jordan, the river, is at flood stage all during harvest, which was at this time of year. Yet as soon as the priests who carried the Ark reached the Jordan and their feet touched the water's edge, the water, imagine this, the water from upstream stopped flowing. It piled up in a heap a great distance away. So the people crossed over opposite Jericho. The priest who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stopped in the middle of the Jordan and stood on dry ground. While all Israel passed by until the whole nation had completed the crossing on dry ground. Now this is very significant. This is a moment where the author includes an important detail, that the Jordan River is at flood stage, which was to show this was not just some nice little creek or little river that was calm and easy. This was a miracle of God. This was proving and showing God's power and his presence was among the people. In fact, here is a video of Jericho River, I'm sorry, Jordan River outside of Jericho, At flood stage, what it may have looked like, this is like current time, but back in the day, that was about a mile wide stretch where they crossed with raging rapids. In addition to this, there was about 2 million people as the people of Israel, including men, women, children, elderly, people who were injured, people who were sick, probably people who were pregnant, you name it. How in the world would you get two million people across a dangerous river at flood stage? This is Joshua's first task as a leader, his leadership test. Do you think he was feeling a little discouraged, a little fearful? Yeah. Now we understand why God told him to be strong and courageous like we read last week three times in chapter one. Listen to God's words again before any of this happened. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. So God tells Joshua that his strength and his courage comes by keeping God's word close, by saying it and obeying it. And that's exactly what Joshua is doing. He's putting God's word, the literal Ten Commandments, in the Ark of the Covenant, God's words out in front of the two million people as there is incredible raging water in the Jordan River flowing. The Ark enters. All of a sudden, the wall builds up, and God's power and his strength are seen as the people need it to cross the river. Well, I don't know about you, but I wonder if anybody in that crowd was thinking something like this to themselves. What in the world is Joshua doing? We should build a boat like Noah did. Or we should ask them to part the sea like Moses. We should wait until the river recedes. This is dangerous. Remember, other than Joshua, none of them were around for the parting of the Red Sea. They don't really have a lot of experience with water. They've been wandering the desert for 40 years. I don't think there were many great swimmers among them. And so imagine the fear that they would have seen, uh, they would have felt upon seeing the Jordan River raging before them. Imagine the the courage it took for the priests to take that first step into the raging water, holding a heavy ark that if they touched it, they'd die. They were carrying it by the poles that you saw sticking out in the front and the back in the picture, um, not knowing if if their feet were about to be swept out from underneath them. 
not knowing that even if they made it across, if the two million people behind them would make it across, they were responsible for the nation of Israel to guide them to safety. And lastly, not knowing what they would even find on the other side, this is a to-be-continued moment in the story of Israel. But God was teaching his people that he is the hero of the quest to the promised land, not them. They have everything they need as long as they keep God's word before them as a priority and they keep their eyes on God. And last week we learned that being strong and courageous, as God commands Joshua in Joshua 1 verse 9, that that requires keeping God's word close by saying it and obeying it. And this week, it means being strong and courageous requires fearing God. It's not the absence of fear. It's fearing only God. It's working through all other fears and deciding that they are nothing compared to the fear of disobeying God and being separated from him. The the priests during that time would have been foolish to not fear the power of the water, but they would have been even bigger fools to fear the water more than the one who created the water itself, than God himself. And to their credit, they showed that they'd rather be swept away in the raging waters than to disobey their God. Well, amazingly, as Kevin told us as he read the scripture, as they keep God's words close and obey it by putting their feet on the edge of the water, the water stopped flowing. It piled up in a heap. I don't even know how water does that. A long way away. Can you imagine? What a sight. What a relief. But they didn't see that and then start to high five each other and say, we did it. No, they kept on taking steps of obedience because they were told to go to the middle of the water. Why? So that the others, the millions behind them, as they're coming down the banks, would be able to see their spiritual leaders in the middle of the riverbed. Because you know what happens when we take those steps of faith and when we fear only God? We pave the way for others to be strong and courageous. That's good. So the fear of God led to a huge step of faith that cleared the way for millions of people to do the same. And the whole nation of Israel was given strength. They were given courage and boldness because of Joshua's faithfulness and because of the faithfulness of the spiritual leaders of that community. But this event wasn't just for Israel. See, none of God's dealings with Israel and his people are only for them. Right from the beginning, God positioned these chosen people to show all nations, including you and me today, our church family, God's power and his presence. You'll see in your readings this week, I know last week we had a reading plan that was available for you. They're actually at the Connection Center if you need one across our campuses. But we're going to be reading along during the weekday, what we're talking about here on the weekends. And this week, you'll be reading Joshua 4. And in Joshua 4, you'll read that God told the people to build a monument from 12 stones, one stone for each tribe of the people of Israel, to take that from the middle of the river of the Jordan, which was now dry as they were walking through it. And it says this in verse 24, to build this monument, God, he said, He did this so that all the peoples of the earth might know that the hand of the Lord is powerful and so that you might always fear the Lord your God. And then if you continue on reading chapter 5, the surrounding nations are described, particularly in verse 1, it says that these nations and these kings noticed God's power, but their fear had a different effect. Verse 1 says that when the neighboring kings heard what God had done and how he dried up the Jordan for the Israelites, it says this, Their hearts melted in fear, and they no longer had the courage to face the Israelites. See, they realized that they could not compete with God's power. And don't miss this. It's interesting how the fear of God, having the proper perspective of who God is, his wonder, his power, his might, how the fear of God gives strength and courage to those who put their faith and trust in him. But for others... The fear of God takes away courage because they don't trust him or because they don't have faith in him. So as we close this morning, I want you to consider the fact that the names Joshua and Jesus mean the same thing in two different languages. They both mean God saves. 
But Joshua joined himself to the word of God in fear and reverence, and God saved him in this circumstance as well as the whole nation of Israel. But Jesus is the word of God, as scripture tells us, and he is the one who saves all of us. He took the punishment for disobedience and sin that we deserve. So we don't have to fear God's wrath. We don't have to fear eternal punishment, but we're able to revere God's power and presence and get strength and courage from it. Do you know how freeing it is to only fear God? And so as we experience his character, meaning his grace, his mercy, his forgiveness, even though we know that he holds the power of life and death, we stand in awe, in reverence, and in wonder. In a moment, we're going to continue our worship through song, but I want you to just consider two things as we close today. First of all, who stood in the river for you? Who was that person whose faith you saw that paved the way for you to develop your faith? Maybe it was the parent or other family member or a friend or a youth leader or a youth pastor. In fact, this week it's important for you to know, church, that we have 65 teenagers from Revive Wesleyan across all of our campuses leaving this afternoon to go to youth camp. And if any of you have ever been to a youth camp, you know how impactful that is. And so keep them in your prayers so that they can continue to follow the course of those who have gone before them and take steps of faith toward God. So who stood in the river for you? And my second question to you is who or what are you fearing more than God? And I want you to recognize as the spirit kind of maybe brings up something that you're fearing more than God, recognize that that fear is draining you of strength and courage because it's misplaced. We fear only God. And when we do so, we gain courage. We gain strength because we look at his power and his might. And we realize that though he could smite us on the spot, instead he gave his son to make a way for us. That's why we gain courage and strength as we put our faith in God. And so whatever the spirit might be kind of stirring in your spirit or, or bringing up in terms of something you might be fearing, I'm gonna have a time of prayer for us where we can repent, we can confess and say, God, I'm fearing that more than I am you. I wanna repent, I wanna turn from that. And so would you stand? I wanna pray over you today as you consider these things and then we'll continue in our worship. Let's pray together. God, I wanna thank you for those who have gone before us. Throughout the generations, Lord, we have centuries and centuries and centuries of faithful believers who have gone before us, who have paved the way so that we can have faith, Lord. I thank you for those people in our lives, those family members or coworkers or friends or pastors or, or youth leaders, Lord. I thank you that are so many who have paved the way for us and ultimately, Lord, I thank you for your son, Jesus, who is the only way to you. He is the only one who could live a sinless human existence and yet die on our behalf. He is the one who is saved. He is the reason that we can draw near to you. And, and Lord, if there's anyone here today that has not yet made that step of faith to put their trust in your son, Jesus, as the only way to God, may this moment be the moment. May it click, Lord. And though maybe they don't have it all figured out, Lord, would they just take that step of faith and say, Jesus, I, I know that you're the son of God. I know that you died for me and I need a savior because I have sinned. Holy Spirit, just work in that person's heart right now. God, we're so thankful for all the people that you put in our life. I pray for these 65 teens from Revive Wesleyan who are joining over 300 teens from different areas and different districts. Lord, would you go before them? Would you pave the way for these teenagers to know you? God, I pray for salvation. I pray for healing. I pray for calling on their lives. I pray for sanctification. I pray for holiness. Lord, I pray for you to do what only you can do in these teenagers' lives. Protect that time from the evil one, Lord Jesus. And God, I also just pray that if there is anything or anyone that we are fearing more than you, 
Holy Spirit, would you bring it to our attention? Would we lay it at your feet right here, right now, recognizing it is a drain on our spirit. And may we put our fear, meaning our revere, uh, reverence and our respect, our awe and wonder in your presence, in your power, in your might, in your character. You are the only true God. You are eternal. You have the power of life and death and you made a way for us. Lord Jesus, may we once again receive that and as a result, leave this place in being strengthened, being encouraged, encouraged for whatever it is that you have for us. You are a good God and we're so grateful for you. We love you and we trust you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Please stand as we continue our worship through song.